On this episode of Marketing Mavericks, we talk about Pandora, we talk about RDO, Spotify, the evolution of marketing music today. I guess you'd call it zero to hero. What are musicians doing to get their music out? Stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This episode of Marketing Mavericks is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash MM. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MM. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, where we talk about everything at the intersection of in the internet and marketing. And today, we're going to talk a lot about the industry of music. How has music changed? How are artists creating music? And how are they dealing with publishers, getting to fans, and all of that fun stuff? We're going to talk with uh, Pandora. We're going to talk on uh, the agency side of the business. We're also going to talk to a writer for Pando Daily and... Yes, we have a pundit in the software business who's also going to talk about his experience in the music industry and what that means for artists and publishers today. Our first guest is Heidi Browning Pearson. She is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Solutions at Pandora. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so I am a... Of course, you know, as probably most of us who listen to music, a big fan of Pandora. You guys pioneered the space of internet radio and really gave a challenge to traditional radio, including satellite radio. And I'm a big fan. If I was uh, joking around before the show, you probably know everything about my musical interests more than I probably would even want to share. But 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 you guys have you pioneered the space, right, Heidi? Yes, absolutely. Um, we pioneered the space through what we call the Music Genome Project. And the idea was, how can we democratize music? How can we deliver a personalized music experience where you're getting uh, endless and effortless discovery and enjoyment of just the music that you love? And we founded our intellectual property, which is the Music Genome Project, over 12 years ago, uh, maybe even 14 years ago. And that is the biggest, the world's biggest taxonomy of music music that exists today. And what we've done is we've broken down each and every song at a song level of up to 450 different musicological attributes. And those musicological attributes are then connected to each other. And this is how, when you're listening to your personalized music experience, we're able to transcend across artists, across songs, across genres to deliver you an experience that's personalized just for what you like. And then each time that you give feedback to Pandora through the, you know, the thumb actions that you provide, you give us signals as to what you like. So it starts with humans who do the analysis. It moves to the uh, music genome uh, algorithm and then is further shaped by the feedback from yourself and from the crowd. And this is what's created this incredibly um, unique and personalized experience and created this entirely um, new way of an expectation of people listening to music and discovering new music. And the idea behind it is really to be able to give emerging artists an opportunity to find audience and connect with fans and being heard at the same level playing field as established artists that people are discovering for the first time or rediscovering. Uh, and behind all of this is this incredible, incredible amount of data. So to answer your question earlier on, do we know more about you than even you do? Yes, the answer is we do. <laughs> we uh, have all of this incredible data and we use that data to make our playlists the best in the world. And we're constantly, constantly working on refining and improving and optimizing those to have the best personalized technology out there. But we're also using that data to provide the most effective advertising experiences out there and also to provide our artist community with the opportunity to understand their audience, who they are, where they are, and what they're listening to. You know, um, a lot has happened since Pandora launched and since uh, Tim Westergren had his idea to change and, and evolve radio. Um, how, how has Pandora changed 
I, and I, I've got to say, I, I was easily one of the first uh, customers in listening to music. I, I was actually a voice major in college and big passion of, uh, for music myself. What, how has Pandora changed since it was originally launched to today, keeping up with a lot of competition in the space, a little different competition, but how has it changed? So we continue to always refine our listener experience based on the feedback that our listeners give to us because we want to continue to invest in developing the best product, the best service out there. And we look at a bunch of different metrics. We look at how many new people are adding Pandora and how long are they listening. We look at user growth and user listening metrics to understand the, pra- the path and the growth trajectory of our brand. And as pioneers of the business, there have been a lot of new entrants that have come into the space over the course of our existence. And We've had, you know, a number of them come in even recently, and we still continue to grow our audience and grow our listening hours because we've had a very, um, you know, strong and committed strategy to, you know, the listener first. We've had a committed strategy to uh, making Pandora as easy and ubiquitous as radio. So that meant um, spending years and years from a business development standpoint, making sure that we're integrated into the internet of things to make sure that we are in the connected home, the connected device, the connected car, so that people could enjoy their listening experience whenever they want, wherever they want, and however they want. And now we're really excited because after all these years of integrating into these consumer electronic devices, we're in over a thousand devices. People are spending a significant amount of time there. We're now integrated in native integrations into automobiles. And that is really the next frontier for us, especially as you start to think of us and our strategy to really re- redefine the radio world, the car is the last piece of that puzzle to make sure that we're delivering this personalized radio experience. Well, and many of us already listen to your service, streaming music in our vehicles through our mobile device. So how is that changing? How are you taking it beyond the mobile device and, uh, and engaging the automobile industry? Right. We have um, we have over 77 million people who listen to Pandora on a monthly basis. And of that, 80% of them listen through mobile devices or mobile connected devices. And as you can imagine, um, people have been very savvy early on by using aux jacks to be able to listen to their Pandora while they're in their car. Well, what we're talking about now is the, the shift to having the actual Pandora be integrated into the head unit of these automotives. So it's a native auto integration. And we work with 26 different auto brands and multiple vehicle or license plates within those brands, plates within those brands to be able to deliver uh, Pandora through the dash, through an in-dash experience. And each and every manufacturer has chosen to take a different uh, approach uh, into how they integrate Pandora. Some have chosen to go down the route of having voice activation, so you can voice activate your stations. Others have embedded thumbs into the actual steering wheel and dash, so you can actually give your thumb signals back while you're driving in a safe uh, manner. So we are excited about the notion that right now 5 million people have activated new cars with Pandora integrated into the system. And when you think about that number, it's pretty remarkable when there are probably what, 15 million cars that are sold, brand new cars that are sold on a yearly basis. 5 million new models have Pandora already activated in them. And we're just excited on how that's going to grow um, as more and more models roll off the lot and more and more people uh, you know, discover that they can activate their Pandora door experience in a much more seamless way. You know, I want to take a step back a little bit because I felt really connected to you when um, I heard you talking about your personal experience. So we've been talking about this really exciting industry that you're in and and all the changes. And I, and I want to get back to that, but I want to take a step back and talk about literally how you personally got started as a marketer uh, in this business. And, uh, and by that, I mean just technology in general. Um, when was your first step into working as a marketer in technology? So my first step in terms of marketing and technology was like many of us when uh, the, you know, we didn't even have computers in our offices in those days, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I worked for a company called Kaplan and it was Kaplan Test Prep. Maybe many of you have taken a test to get into grad school, law school, college, et cetera. And that was really my first introduction to the power of um, uh, having computerized technology to assist in marketing. And it goes down to a very, very simple uh, task that we had. We were, uh, you know, trying to really understand 
understand and correlate our advertising efforts to uh, events? Uh, what, how was our advertising investment um, driving success, whether it was driving people to events or driving people to purchase Kaplan uh, test prep programs? And you always had to rely on the human uh, question. How did you hear about us? And, you know, nine times out of 10, people say word of mouth. Well, you couldn't actually track back to the advertisements that you had on the radio or on television or in newspapers. And when I got introduced uh, to the clever tracking that the internet afforded, it was that aha moment for me, which is, you mean, I never have to ask the question again. I will just know because the internet has all these tracking capabilities that would allow me to correlate all of my media and marketing investments to real actions. So that was my first love affair was all through the data. And then from there, I went to one of the first digital agencies uh, in the space, and that was organic. And that's where I continued to really build that fusion between technology and media and measurement and really understanding how each of those drives each other. Uh, and then through my career, I've had a love for music. And so I've had the great fortune of going between agency life at organic to MySpace. Uh, I was you know, part of the MySpace trajectory and then uh, went back into the agency space, worked at a traditional agency, and then came to Pandora. And I love being at that intersection of music and technology and lifestyle, which is exactly where Pandora sits today. It does. How, um, so let's, you know, you actually gave a really powerful TED Talk. And so if somebody's uh, listening to this and you want to check that out, I, I highly recommend it. It's really about just this idea of women and emotional IQ and, and what that means. And you tell your story about going to work in the business and how your, some of your insecurities and how mm -hmm. you were able to make a difference. Looking back at when you first started to today, um, what was, what was something that maybe you wish you had done differently in getting started that, um, that you look back as a learning lesson? Hmm. That's a, that's a really great question. You know, I, I look at everything, whether it's been a success or a failure as a learning lesson. I'm always optimizing, always trying to learn on everything that I've learned. I think if I look back into my career um, and even into my aspirations and dreams, I think it's like having the confidence that you can do anything you want uh, is something that I didn't have at the time. I had the confidence that I could execute the plans ahead of me and I had the confidence that I had really great ideas, but I didn't have the confidence to say I could step out on my own and start my own business tomorrow, right? I always felt like I needed to go through some sort of process, like the official work process, the official growth trajectory to achieve those goals. And I think today's world is very different. You've got, you know, technology, you've got funding, you've got ideas, you've got all, um, you know, you've got the, the, the global citizens of the world to help shape and help and support you. And I think the young people of today can actually live their dreams and achieve their dreams of, you know, owning business, starting businesses, starting nonprofits in a much easier way than in my day when I was just not heard of. You um, talked very personal um, in your TED talk about um, the loss of your grandmother and how much of an impact that she had on you and the way that you approach business. And I think, you know, just as a leader in business, you've got some really strong um, points of view on, on what makes a good leader. How did your grandmother influence you? My uh, thank you for um, for pointing that out. My grandmother. First of all, I came from a family of very strong women. Not one, but both of my grandmothers started their own businesses and ran their own businesses in a time when women didn't even wear pants. So this is an incredibly strong background that I've got here. And um, my my grandmother was always focused on the positive. And I feel like that is something that it seems like an obvious thing that we should all focus on, but it's so hard to do at every moment in the moment when you're there. And the things that I learned from her is how to free, reframe thing, situations that come at you. Because in you always have this inner voice, right? This inner voice that might cast a little doubt. Can I accomplish that? Can I do that? I've never done that before. But if you reframe it and really break it down, you can accomplish anything by putting a positive outlook on it and a positive attribute and asking yourself the rational questions and challenging yourself to overcome any fear or questions that you might have about yourself because the worst thing that you can do is fail and learn and then try again. And so she was 
always the spirit of positivity. Uh, and I've carried that through in pretty much every aspect of what I do, how I engage with people at work, how I engage with people in life. And I just, you know, I think that it's the most underrated quality uh, in the business space, um, but it's one of the most important because it helps you connect with people. It helps you have empathy for people uh, and with people, and it helps you, um, you know, maintain your feet on their ground while you've got your head in the sky trying to achieve your dreams. We as, uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of speak to this gender issue, which um, women in technology, this has been an ongoing issue. You know, we need more women. We need more women to pursue you know, marketing is, is a little easier, I think, but just in technology in general, what would your advice be to um, the, the startups out there or the technology leaders in hiring women? And what would your be to, advice be to women who um, are starting their career and potentially considering getting into the technology space? So for women, I'd say go for it. Like there is no better opportunity than now to get involved in it. And if you have a passion for it and a love for it, just like go, uh, you know, go all in on it. Because um, I think that it's really important that we have a gender balance in terms of perspective. Uh, it's, you know, been studied over the course of the years that men and women um, actually approach problems very differently. And when you have one or more women in a boardroom, a good, you know, change happens when you have three women in a boardroom, big change happens. And that's because there's a balance. There's a different way people look at problems. There's a different way men and women look at problems. And I think that we need to have more women infused in the system and growing up and, uh, you know, and, um, you know, uh, achieving higher levels uh, and all the way up into the boardroom to have that sort of balanced conversation, discourse, debate, et cetera, around solving big business problems. Okay. So I'm going to switch back to, to the Pandora and we get lots of questions in the chat room, but I want to talk about the user of Pandora, especially as other services have come about your competitors in the space and how they're doing things maybe a little differently. Everybody, everybody's models a little bit different. How has the user profile for Pandora changed from launch to today? And, and is that a profile that you want to maintain? Uh, could you be more specific about what you mean by the user profile? So, um, like so you, you know, where did your, so the users of Pandora, maybe the early, um, early on users of internet based radio, how, what would that, what did that demographic look like? And then how, do, how does that look today? Are, has it grown? Uh, are, are different ages using it as a certain gender? Um, who's using Pandora today? Got it. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, uh, actually, you know, when you're all at almost 80 million people, uh, you're actually transcending across all generations, right, on Pandora. Early on, uh, and still one of our strongest bases are the millennials, that 18 to 34-year-old market. Uh, but we also, so we see an incredible usage there. But we've also, especially as we've uh, been uh, integrated into those consumer electronic devices, um, seen a lot of, um, you know, people that are over 35 adopting Pandora in some of these higher end technology, you know, implementations. We have Pandora in a refrigerator, for example. We have it, you know, through Blu-ray, through your Samsung, uh, through your auto. So you start to see the, um, the the growth of Pandora going that direction, but also the teens uh, really love Pandora. They find it as, a, you know, a fantastic way to lean back and listen and discover music that they might not otherwise uh, hear. So what's next? I mean, again, you've got a lot of com competition in the space. I see that you're going uh, to the connected car, which I think makes absolute sense. And it does seem like that's a, an obvious move for Pandora. What, what are you seeing as an evolution from the standpoint of how you connect to artists or how you connect artists to fans? What's, what's next? So we've got uh, we've got a number of really interesting ways that we can connect artists to fans, and that is a big mission of ours. And we actually connect artists and brands and fans together. And we do this by leveraging our incredible data set. We do uh, these uh, programs called Pandora Presents, which are a personalized concert series. And we look at the data. Uh, we see which artists are trending, um, who's added their station the most, who's thumbed the most, and we create a concert in that city just for the fans of that artist, just for the people who have that station, who have thumbed it. And that gives an artist an opportunity to have an intimate performance with just their favorite fans here uh, in, you know, in a, a venue that's uh, really amazing. And there's nothing like the energy and the excitement and enthusiasm that you have when you have an opportunity like that to create your most passionate fans together with an artist. We also have programs in which we, you know, take multiple artists 
us and pull them together that are loosely connected through the genome. So we have what's called the Discovery Den at uh, South by Southwest and during the holidays where we look at multiple different artists and genres and connect them together so that people can get a sense of the new music across genre, genre and across artists that they uh, have, might not have otherwise been exposed to or celebrate the music that they love. Uh, and then we've also been really focused on developing original content in the audio space. When you think about the mobility mindset and the fact that everybody is walking around with a mobile device in their hands and earbuds, it's an earbud culture, right? The earbuds in their ears, they might not always be looking at their screen, but they are listening to Pandora natively. And we want to be able to provide original content, interviews with artists, um, you know, stories, uh, episodic content uh, stories around artists' lives and careers that we can bring to our fans because there's that expectation of Pandora's, you know, such a personal, uh, mu personalized music experience. It's on your most personal device and there's that expectation of that personal connection to the artist and we want to facilitate that through, you know, our discovery and through our brand programs that we bring to life. Well, I've definitely been inspired by listening to you talk just about being a leader and I think as a woman, um, that you've got some great advice, like I mentioned your TED talk before. And I think, you know, when, uh, as women are entering this field, it's really important, but it's also important to stay focused on, on listening to your employees and keeping your employees, uh, focused, especially in an industry that changes so much. And I don't mean just music, certainly, but to technology and software, um, how, how do, how well do you engage your team, uh, with ideas on how to evolve your business and what's the culture like at Pandora? The culture at Pandora is like by far my favorite thing of all my career in, uh, in, in, you know, technology and in advertising and in music. This is by far the best culture uh, here. And we take it very, very seriously. Uh, and we screen for that before you even join Pandora. You have to fit into our culture. And at the core of it, it's all about collaboration and respect. It's about that balance of confidence and humility. And it's about trusting each other. And through all of those principles, we call them the Pandora principles, we inspire great ideas and great uh, collaboration. Uh, some of the, you know, it, we, as you mentioned, you still have to have focus, but it doesn't mean we stop the ideas. And we've got this long list of, you know, uh, waiting list of all these amazing ideas. And we're taking a surgical approach to focusing on what's the right time uh, and the right idea to execute as we continue to grow and evolve our business and our product. Do you attend concerts? Do you, you know, as maybe as a youth you did probably, right? But do you attend concerts today? Do you go to concerts? I do. I go to all the concerts we throw. We uh, we had 29 live music events last year alone. Wow. So uh, that's a lot. But I also do attend live concerts outside of that. So yes, it never gets old. Personal guilty music pleasure. Go. <laughs> well, um, I love Hall & Oates. I really do. And uh, every now and then... I gotta admit, I turn on a little Bee Gees, uh, so I'm a. Th it's a. It's a throwback for me, but it's fun. There's nothing uh, you know more fun than a little disco. You know, you have gone up so much further in my book. I mean, Hall and Oates, really, Man Eater. Come on, you can't get any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have a common bond. I love an '80s girl. Music brings us together. <laughs> it it does bring us together. It's funny that uh, Evan Green. I don't know if you know him. He's uh, head of marketing for the Recording Academy, the Grammys, and. He's, mm -hmm. he's been a frequent guest. He's got a really good insight on how to engage fans. And I think as an, an event specifically, I mean, they started using social media to really promote um, their specific event that you have to tune into, right? So you can't see it live streaming. You actually have to watch CBS to, to see it. And once they started engaging fans over the internet, they saw a 35% increase in Nielsen ratings, 32% uh, of that within tweens. So it was a really important thing that they actually understood how to connect. How does Pandora continue to connect? I mean, obviously you're a connected software. I mean, you, you go to Pandora's site and you mentioned earlier how you can like something and you can share with your friends. How important is that in the growth of Pandora? It's absolutely paramount. And it was actually one of the um, principles that that Tim Westergren felt very strongly about, which is we will have a personal connection with our listeners. We have uh, an entire team of people called listener support who answer each and every email, tweet, comment that comes in about Pandora, and they and they have you know personal relationships. It's amazing to um, hear back from people who write in how 
few people actually, few companies actually take the time to respond and have a dialogue with them. So first and foremost, we're always personal. Um, we use the social levers. We use uh, discovery. We use our email to make sure that we're surfacing what's new music that, that we think you might like based on the feedback that you've given to us. Um, what are the new opportunities? We use um, uh, in some of our advertising units, our audio advertising units and our display uh, advertising units to alert you to opportunities like those personalized concert series if you fit the criteria of having you know, uh, started a station or thumbed up that artist station. So you get an exclusive invitation to that. So we have a number of different communication tools that we use today, uh, as well as where we're you know, kind of shaping the future through notifications and other social cues to make sure that we're closing the loop and connecting everyone around uh, their experience. What is your biggest challenge right now? What do you think is, as an industry, is it getting, um, you know, the managers, the the uh, producers to understand? Is it is it connecting artists? Do artists get what's happening? I mean, where where is uh, where do you see the biggest challenge for the industry specifically, not just Pandora maybe, but the industry in general? I think that we're at this tipping point in the industry, right, where people are understanding um, the power of internet radio, the power of streaming radio, how sizable the audiences are, and they're trying to figure out how does that fit into their traditional marketing and promotional plans. And I think that that is where we are all learning together. We're able to deliver a powerful audience, a targeted audience of your most passionate fans. We're able to deliver the artist community the data back so they can understand that. We're able to connect advertisers with fans and fans with brands. And so it's an op so I think where we are right now is this interesting place of, you know, how do you bring bring this into your traditional model? You evolve your tentpole marketing and your points of view around this. And then how do we evolve together to really, you know, push forward on creating these deeper connections? Well, I am not just a big fan of Pandora, but I'm a big fan of yours. And I really appreciate you taking some time out. I know you've got uh, to get somewhere, but I appreciate you giving us some time today. I'd love to have you come back and talk more about music and the evolution of the uh, changes in the industry and what's happening. Until then, if somebody wants to connect with you, Heidi, what's the best way they can do that? They can connect with me via Twitter, or uh, you could reach out to me directly at Pandora at hbrowning at pandora.com. And we will definitely be listening. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was Heidi Browning Pearson. So I am a big fan of not just Pandora, but I think she's a she's a really good leader in the space of women and technology. And she's got some great advice. Check out her TED Talk because I think that um, you would be remiss not to check that out. Before we get to our next guest, I'm going to go ahead and actually thank our sponsors who sponsor Marketing Mavericks without them. We would not be here, which we really appreciate. Um, our sponsor today is ZipRecruiter. Um, okay, so are you hiring? Most uh, most of the time, uh, businesses definitely are reaching a point where they have to hire somebody or they don't continue to grow. Uh, do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? It's a big question for a lot of employers today. With so many job boards, who knows which one will produce the best talent? Well. If you want to fill that position fast with the perfect candidate, you need to post your job on all the job sites, right? Well, now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 50 plus job sites at once with one single click. ZipRecruiter also posts your job on social networks like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. ZipRecruiter will add your company logo and colors to make your job pages an extension of your business. You can add ultimate users to your account, create an instant job page on your website, and include a company careers page to use as a careers link. Post once and watch the qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. ZipRecruiter.com will automatically highlight the best candidates. You can screen them, rate them, then hire the right person fast. Try ZipRecruiter and find out why they've been used by over 100,000 businesses. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free for a four-day trial. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MM. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MM. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Marketing Mavericks. Thank you so much, ZipRecruiter. We definitely appreciate that. And uh, I highly believe in posting to a lot of different sites. I think that you don't always 
know where that next best candidate is going to come from. All right. Well, our next half of the show, we've got a couple of three, actually, really interesting people in the music business. We've got Ted Cohen, who is the managing partner at Tag Strategic. Welcome, Ted. Thank you. Good to be here. Absolutely good to have you. We also have Jeffrey Cullen, who is the glo global manager at Microsoft. Welcome, Jeffrey, return guest of the show. Hey, Tanya. Hi, everyone. Good to be back. Welcome back. And David Holmes, who is the East Coast editor at Pando Daily. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, thanks, all guys, for uh, for coming to the show. I just want to give a little context. Now, Jeffrey, you've been on the show before. Um, we, we love having you back. Our marketing, one of our uh, marketing slash music guys. Ted, you're new to the show and uh, you've been in the industry for a long time. How many years now? Uh, I started working on digital in uh, 1982. So this is my 32nd year. Congratulations. That's, uh, <laughs> you were an infant, apparently, when you started working in music. Right. I mean, you were a toddler, right? Yep. We ended up, uh, I was working at Warner Records and Alan Kay, who had invented the mouse and the graphic interface, had joined Atari. And he uh, called my boss up at Warner Records and he said, when the CD that comes out in 83 starts playing on computers, it might mess with the music industry a bit. <laughs> um, not really sure how that turned out. Yeah, that was maybe a little before my time. But, you know, you've worked with a lot of really cool bands. You've got a long background in just this space in general. How did you get started in the music business? And, um, you know, let's let's go back to the beginning before we even so give some people some context as to how you got started. Uh, started managing bands in high school. Uh, I, managed in, I managed a guy named Eric Carmen all by myself. You know the song? <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, everybody knows the song. They sing it in the shower. So I managed him in high school. He was a prima donna in training, grew up to be a major prima donna, but um, went off to college in pre-med at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York, and was uh, in pre-med for about six weeks when I found out that Rod Serling was a teacher at the school and went to one of his lectures and switched majors and moved into communications. Uh, that led to ending up at Columbia Records and then Warner Records. And uh, I was doing what they called artist development. I'm sorry, I was doing local promotion. But I had a bad habit on the weekend of running away with the bands. <laughs> and uh, after two years of disappearing for three or four days at a time, they moved me into artist development, which was running away with the bands. And so I met Todd Rundgren, who got me into computers and got me into video. And... Uh, moved to Boston, met the folks at Advent, which made speakers, but they also made uh, this big screen TV. And in 77, as I mentioned earlier, we went to uh, Chicago for CES, where CES used to be based before it moved to Las Vegas. And Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak walked into our hotel room and offered to trade an Apple One computer for a, an Advent big screen TV. Uh, I got to know them, and then I got to know the Atari folks, and it just started snowballing in terms of what I believed technology could do to enhance fan connection. And did you make the trade? So, and how'd that turn out for you? Oh, well, for me, I, I don't know who ended up with the computer. I know it's worth about a quarter of a million dollars. I, I was hanging out with the Advent folks. The guy who had bought Advent, real quick story, is a guy named Peter Sprague. His parents owned National Semiconductor back when Silicon Valley was really Silicon Valley because of chip manufacturing. And uh, he was this very wealthy guy who he liked Aston Martin. So instead of buying the car, he bought the company. Uh, he liked Advent speakers, so he bought the company. So we became friends for some strange reason. And he dragged me to, not dragged me, but he asked me to come to Chicago with him and sort of hang out with them. And I'm sitting in his room and that's when Jobs and Wozniak walked in. And they literally had an Apple One in a zipper canvas case and it looked like a bunch of circuit boards. And they said, we need a big screen TV to show color graphics. Can we trade for one of those TVs? So the trade was done between Advent and uh, Steve Jobs. Um, but somebody ended up with that computer and it's worth a lot more than the TV is today. <laughs> So, okay, you you now work with um, disruptive startups in the music space. I've heard you talk. Just, 
destructive and disruptive. I don't mean I don't I like I like disruptive startups. I mean, you know, I met uh, in was uh, September Octo- no it was October of ninety nine. I flew up to San Francisco and walked into the conference room at Napster, and on the floor was Sean Fanning and Sean Parker sleeping on the floor. Fanning was using a motorcycle helmet as a pillow. And uh, I had been sent there by the, what they refer to affectionately as the evil Uncle John, uh, who took most of the company from his nephew. And uh, I thought I was coming up there to consult. They thought I was coming up there to be the new CEO. So I stayed in a consulting role from October of 99 until May of 2000 when I joined EMI. So on a Friday, I was working for Napster, and on Saturday, I took over as basic global head of digital business development for EMI. And uh, what was good about it for EMI was we had a mandate where I came in with the ability to do any deal I wanted to do, and we could do them very quickly, and that lasted for about two years until iTunes debuted. Before iTunes, it was three signatures for me to do a global deal. Because of the success of iTunes, the uh, number of signatures ballooned to 14, which made it really hard to get anything done post iTunes launch. And, you know, you, you, you evolved through the industry. You've seen lots of changes. I want to get to um, some of the things that are happening today and what your point of view is on the industry. You've got a lot of great stories. We're going to have to have you come back and give the whole history of, of yourself and, and what you've done because there's a lot of interesting things I found in Discovery uh, before uh-huh. having you on the show. So some of which I hope to, to get out of you. So, so David, okay. uh, you've been writing on, you write for Pando Daily and you've been writing on music. You're a musician yourself. Um, and you write about the intersection of music and technology and how... Um, basically things are really evolving and how important it is for indie artists. So uh, talk about how important it is. You know, um, Ted was talking about how he got started helping artists. And I think certainly a lot has happened from then to today. Um, Van Halen and Cranberries love them, but a lot is, a lot is different today for indie artists. What's different today versus uh, when I was growing up with music? Well, in a, in a lot of ways, it's, it's much better. Um, You've got people like Steve Albini saying um, that, and he produced the Pixies and was in the punk band Big Black. Um, you've got people like him who are saying, the internet's the best thing to happen to music since punk rock, because now basically anybody can have a worldwide distribution channel for their music. So from that perspective, it's been great. Um, I think one of the big issues that indie artists are grappling with right now are... Um, discoverability issues. So, um, you know, when when independent record stores were still, you know, in every city across the country, you would go there, you would have a relationship with the person who would sell you the music, and you would discover all sorts of obscure artists or obscure genres. That's changed to an extent. Um, what, what they've found is that um, the... I think that the streaming music services like Spotify and RDO, to an extent, they benefit the more established artists more than independent artists. Um, Part of that's monetary, for example, um, because the more plays that you have, the actual higher your per play royalty rate is. So Rihanna will have a higher royalty rate than the Cloud Nothings, for example. Um, But the other issue is that I I really think that no one's quite figured out how to take that uh, that human creation that you had prior to the internet where you'd hear about a band because of an older sibling or somebody at your school or the record store clerk. I think they're still really struggling how to to convert that to the to the digital age for streaming services. You know, Jeff, you've had a background working not just with RCA records, Virgin Records. You started your own agency working with Red Bull, which is always been, I think, a really interesting uh, innovator in marketing and trying to engage fans in some very kind of grassroots ways. And today I think of a lot of the ways that we use social media as very grassroots, right? Grassroots kind of marketing. Would you agree with David? I mean, where are indie artists today? Uh, I absolutely agree with David. I think I, I miss that element of going into a physical record store, mainly just to find out what new artists were happening and also the the thing that uh 
was wonderful about physical musical stores or physical uh, stores were that was a place to promote local concerts as well, where you could find out about a lot of the up and coming bands. Um, I think there's almost a need for a curation system like that. I mean, one of the things I think missing from big retailers like Amazon is there's no way to really find out, well, who are the new artists that I should be paying attention to if I'm into this type of genre of music. Uh, the social web, you know, it's interesting you bring something up, Tanya, because Facebook a couple of years ago said they wanted to be that curator again, and I don't think they've necessarily made steps in that direction. One of the issues might also be they never have really worked with a lot of publishers to clear a lot of music uh, licensing. So it never really has become sort of like the MySpace and if you think about it, MySpace, the interesting thing about it was there was a lot of music promotion there because they actually did the back end work to clear a lot of uh, publishing. So it was a place where a lot of bands sort of set up shop and ran a lot of their promotion. We haven't seen that too much on Facebook. In fact, Facebook, I think, has really sort of looked for, for third parties to offer the streaming services and they act as sort of the, uh, the tipping point to find these new artists. But uh, there really is no service that really provides that. It, it, it almost is yearning for a startup mentality to sort of collect some of the best uh, minds of various genres to get together and sort of uh, talk in sort of these, I guess, in like a chat board-esque uh, manner about like what, what bands are happening and, and, and what bands, you know, t to look out for. I think that's the one thing that's very hard is the discoverability angle. And because of that, I think a lot of artists aren't able to really sort of become bigger in a way that they can then support themselves. And we, and we know that that's not really through record sales, but mainly through merchandise and touring and uh, third party integrations. You know, Ted, that's exactly what you do with your agency. You work with um, startups that are trying to make a difference and change mm -hmm. things. So I'm going to ask you, since Jeff brought up MySpace, which apparently, um, right. I think Jeff's still using MySpace. I'm not sure. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> Own it, Jeff. Uh, you know. What happened to MySpace? Like, what was the okay. what was the downfall of MySpace, Ted? Well, actually, the downfall of MySpace is what Jeff said they, you thought he did. they did right. They decided to create a music service, and they brought a guy named Courtney Holt in, among other people, and, and Jason Hershorn and a few other people, and they went to the labels, and this is as I was, I think I'd already left EMI, and they struck licensing deals to create a MySpace music service, but they gave the labels a seat at the table. And all of a sudden you had four major label groups that were all telling MySpace how to do it. And so all of a sudden you had the industry running the store and it wasn't a good outcome. But MySpace did some, I mean, MySpace was great. I met Chris, at, uh, early on when he started it, and I had one of these great Zelig moments. There's a place in L.A. called Kate Manolini's. It's a great restaurant down on Wilshire. And I called Chris and I said, let's have lunch. And we meet for lunch. And I said, I really like what you're doing. Uh, I know some guys that have some money. Maybe I can help you raise some money to take it to another level. And he goes, that's really nice of you. I'll get back to you on that. And the next morning in the L.A. Times, it was News Corp buys MySpace. And he called me a couple days later and said, I couldn't tell you, but I really appreciated the offer. I think they did some great stuff. Um, I think the problem with MySpace was that the pages, the artist pages, anybody's page, looked like a collage, looked like Pinterest on acid. I think when Facebook came along, there was something that was really good about the orderly structure of how a page was laid out. So whether you were a band or an individual or a celebrity, people knew how to navigate it. So that was good. What Facebook is doing now, which I have a real problem with, they let people build big followings and all of a sudden then pulled the plug on them. So if you're an artist on Facebook and I'm going to use hypothetically a band like Linkin Park, um, They've got like 14 million followers on Facebook. It used to be that their management company, the collective, could send, you know, or the band could send messages out to all their fans via their Facebook page. Now Facebook is saying, you've got to pay us $25,000 to reach out to those fans. And it's, um, they've kind of put a chokehold on your access to your own audience. 
You know, and you bring up an interesting t conversation around Facebook. So something, David, I know you've written about and you, you we kind of discussed is this idea about YouTube, for example, who's been all about, you know, uh, fostering unknown talent and trying to help unknown talent get started. What would you say about the YouTube model versus maybe some of the other social networks and how they're working? I mean, is the YouTube model still working or... I mean, is Facebook broken because they're charging and it's kind of expensive and we don't even know if it's really working? I mean, who's got the right model? Well, I, I absolutely agree with Ted about how not just artists, but publishers, brands, everybody has become so reliant now on these promoted posts. And again, you're right. They're, the metrics involved in terms of how these uh, posts are performing aren't great. So they don't even know if it's working. So um, I think I think YouTube YouTube's at a really really interesting spot right now because you know again historically YouTube has been a great place for a completely unknown person a completely independent creator to to completely blow up and they are continuing to do a lot of things to foster and cultivate that talent. Um, uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal last week said that they're in talks with independent creators to provide all sorts of funding in, t in terms of helping them market themselves, which is great. The weird thing about YouTube is that they're also starting this streaming service that is modeled in large part after Spotify, RDO, et cetera. And with that model, they're actually doing, well, we'll see what happens, but they're, you know, I'm sure some of you know, independent labels accused YouTube of basically offering them below market terms, terms that were worse than Spotify, worse than RDO, and then saying if they didn't accept them, they were going to take them off of the regular YouTube platform. Now, the public outcry over that was huge. People I've talked to in the industry say that YouTube is almost certainly going to go back on that. But regardless, it sort of makes you wonder about what, what YouTube is doing. It's almost like a Jekyll and Hyde situation where you've got YouTube, the larger platform, is very, very good for independent creators, but the streaming service that they're starting, you know, I'm, I'm not really so sure. Okay. Well, you know, it. Go, jump sorry. in, Ted. Absolutely. Okay. So I had an interesting moment. In 2006, I got invited to speak at the Aspen Institute, which I had no idea what it was. And a friend, I was about to tell a friend, I was telling a friend I was about to cancel, and they said, do you know what Davos is? And I said, yeah. And they said, uh, have you ever spoken to Davos? I said, not yet. And they said, go speak at Aspen Institute. It's probably as close as you'll ever get. So I go there and I walk into the, there's a cocktail party on Wednesday night. And I walk in at six o'clock and I walk into the room and I turn to Charlie Firestone, the executive director. And I said, uh, coffee or dessert? And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, am I here to serve coffee or am I here to serve dessert? Because I look out in the room and the other people attending are Madeline Albright, uh, Craig Newmark from Craigslist. Reed Hunt from the FCC, Linda Resnick, who owns Palm and Fiji and Blue Diamond Almonds. And he says, oh, no, you're the guest of honor. You're here to talk about the transition. I said, what transition? He says, from a distribution economy to an attention economy. And that's the problem we're in right now. The problem we're in is 15 years ago, your goal was to get your music into Best Buy, into Walmart, into Tower Records. Now anyone can get their music distributed. It's all about getting attention. So it is about what we were talking about earlier about curation, about, you know, these influencers. You only have so many Amoeba records. There's only a few of those stores out there now that really mean something. But there are, you know, some glimmers on the horizon. I mean, while Pandora does a great job, I think Slacker does a better job of curation. Uh, there's a new service called Milk. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, M-I-L-Q. And Milk was started by a guy named Don McKinnon. Don was the guy who created the in-store music service at Starbucks a few years ago, the Hear Music, uh, Burn Your Own CD um, experiment. And Milk is a curation tool for people to share discovery. So those give me a lot of hope because right now, while it, everyone has access to an audience, the competition for that audience is fierce. I, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think especially as artists are discovering how 
to, you know, get their music out there for the first time. They're releasing it. Let's talk about somebody who's not a new artist, um, but who's been out there for a long time. I think 1979 he started, Al Yankovic. Weird oh, Al. <laughs> he's do he's that doing... Is, that's such a big story this week. <laughs> Everybody is talking about that. Well, and so is what he's doing brilliant? I mean, is it this idea of releasing a song a day to promote his album? Is this something that young artists should pay attention to? Or does this only work because it's Weird Al? No, but it's a digital... I mean, we talk about digital stunts. So Weird Al does this. You're now going to have 5,000 bands doing it next week. Beyonce dropped her album overnight with no promotion. Now artists tried to do that. You have to use these not not as inspiration, not as imitation, because it's not the it's not the immediate fix. So everyone's talking about what Al has done, and he's he's look he's a really smart guy, and he's been very clever. And there's some great articles out there, but you should use that as just something to think about, not to try and imitate. And it's the imitation stuff that drives me crazy because you will have five thousand artists next week trying the same thing. Got to agree with Ted there. I mean, what we have to think about and what most artists have to think about going forward, and we touched on this when we talked about publishing too, Tanya, is media is the new creative. So when I talk to a lot of strategists who say, what are the best practices for using media? There are none. It's exactly. however you want to use it. And we're stuck in an era where we have a lot of people in big business who think they want to move toward an algorithm. They want to move towards scale. And we really don't live in that economy anymore. Uh, anymore, as, as Ted noted, it's really an attention economy, which is why you have things like information jamming and culture culture jamming. Uh, thing techniques that were used by political groups now are used by marketers to ba mainly gain attention. And I think the reason that marketers are doing that is because it's almost impossible to be discovered. Uh, in this day and age, and specifically in music, because, I mean, if you think about it, there's all these studies on, well, people still find out about music, uh, our new music, through radio. I don't know where those studies are coming from. I think a lot of them are actually <laughs> done by the broadcasters. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, we have to realize that, you know, media is the new creative. And I think younger bands, I mean, there's a lot of really great things that are done. I mean, what Al Yankovic has done is he's he's realized, hey, I'm going to use media in any way possible to... Uh, have people discover my new album. I haven't had a new album out in the market for a very long time, so this is what I'm going to to do. Uh, and uh, I think anyone who tries to imitate that, it's just not going to have the same effect. You have to think about what you, you know, who your audience is and how you're going to use media. I think actually the big player won't even be a Facebook or any of these other platforms. I think the big player will be a, you know, a mobile video platform um, that maybe is not even up and running that People will capture artists live and be able to share those with a small circle of friends. I think one of the things I've noticed this past week is uh, a technology out of London called Tune Picks. You're able to take a picture and then put music to it and share it with your friends. And I said to everyone, this, this could be bigger than Instagram because we share emotions that way. But you're also finding out about new artists and, and music in that manner. And um, Instagram immediately said, oh, here's how you add music to, to, uh, to our photos. So right. I think those are, these are things, you know, we have to think about in terms of where technology is going. And you have to look at what younger people are doing. And most of them are not using Facebook. They're not using these other platforms we're used to. It's going to come from a mobile video, P2P, small contextual network because things uh, are discovered in small groups best. I mean, I think... Um, uh, uh, David brought up uh, Steve Albini from Big Black. I was a huge Big Black fan when I was younger because my older brother was a Big Black fan and 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 uh, collected a lot of that punk rock music. And uh, that's all from small circles of people. So we're moving away from the big, large social network to smaller clusters where music, I think, will be discovered. And then from there, it can be you know the ones that actually have the w uh, a way to break through will always break through because that's just how good art travels. Well, and you know, Ted, I've heard you talk about, you know, telling artists, no, no, you're not ready. You shouldn't get out there too soon. And David, you've actually talked about um, this idea around getting, you know, people to refer to you. So, okay. So, so yeah, I was going to say, no, I agree. And you know, the funny thing is because of my music background, I beat the uh, whatever out of my clients <laughs> because I treat our clients like, baby bands. And when they say they want to go have the big meeting with Comcast 
or the big meeting with Amazon or the big meeting with Microsoft. It's literally like telling the band you're not ready to play yet. You still need to rehearse more, whether it's getting their app together, getting their business plan together, their monetization. Everybody's rushing to market. And you talk about, the, the you, I think it was David, we were talking about a, a big mobile video play. Was that you, David? That yeah. Uh, the thing that's interesting about that is if you ask Daniel Graff, who I think currently works at Twitter, um, he will tell you that he did that five years ago with Kite, K-Y-T-E, Kite TV. There have been, you know, when we talk about Pandora being the innovator, they've done an amazing job of bringing it to market, but I think the folks at Music Match would argue that they were doing Pandora 10 years before Pandora. There have been pioneers in the area, and whether it's there's not enough bandwidth or there's not enough, you know, money there to pull it off, for everything that we look at, even the idea of the cloud and cloud music services, back in 2001, there was Music Bank and there was uh, uh, MyPlay that were both offering cloud music storage. And, you know, 10 years later, the cloud comes along from Amazon and Apple and everybody goes, you know, it really takes Steve Jobs to come up with these ideas. So it's not so much that the ideas haven't been out there before, it's gonna be the mainstreaming of them. So I'm going to date myself a little bit here and talk about high fidelity and how we used to get um, best advice at the guy at the record store. Yeah, right. I remember records. Uh, and, and now, you know, Jeff, you mentioned getting advice from friends. David, you recently wrote about this and the idea of where we get the best advice. Because to your point, Ted, some bands aren't really ready. And to your point, Jeff, we're just getting the advice from our friends. But how do we broaden that spectrum, David? Well... I think that there, there's an interesting um, app that RDO just purchased called uh, Tastemaker X, and they do an interesting job of sort of gamifying credibility around these sort of super influencers. So um, you could you could think of it almost like a clout model, except for in, in my opinion. If you're providing really, really good music taste, you're providing much more value than than just somebody with a high cloud score per se. So I think that um, I think that that's really interesting. I think that if RDO, I think the challenge, there are a lot of good curation apps, and obviously there are a lot of very good streaming music apps. I think the challenge for everybody has been trying to figure out how to merge those into one experience because Spotify, for example, early early on their idea of social curation was just sending every single song that you listen to to Facebook. And that is a terrible way to do it because you know what? Sometimes I listen to things that I don't want people to know about, you know? So (laughs) very, very often actually. So I, I, I think that people are still trying to figure out a way to, to not only have a good curation model, I think that Tastemaker and RDO, I, I think that does, but then the next step is definitely integrating it so that it's really seamless into, into the whole experience of, of listening to music. You know, it's- you know there's, I'm sorry, there's another thing on that thread. You know, uh, there's a big debate going on of what, the, what a skip means, you know, what a thumbs down means, because one of the things when we're using algorithms to figure out people's musical tastes. If a song comes along and I skip it or I thumb it down, am I thumbing it down because I don't like it? Or am I thumbing it down because... Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) (laughs) Thumbing it down. All right, well, so, okay. I, so here's the thing I have. I mean, uh, you know, I personally like to use, I use a lot of different music services. I use Pandora. I use Spotify. What I like about Spotify is I can ask for somebody specifically to play. What I don't like is asking for a specific artist and then I get somebody like that person. Um, Where do you think that we need to go with that? I mean, David, I mean, what do you think is is more popular? Is it the, I like a band that sounds like, or I want this specific artist? Because if we ask for a specific artist, we really aren't expanding our listening genre, but yet, so Pandas are doing, Panda, uh, Pandora is doing a really good job of allowing that to expand, but sometimes I just want to listen to a very specific artist. What say ye, David? I think it depends on an individual's mood. I also just think it depends on the individual. You know, half of my friends swear by Pandora. Personally, I never use it. I'm like you. I you know, 
get recommendations from blogs or what have you, and and, and then I'll just I'll just hop on Spotify and and find it that way. Um, I think that I what's what's interesting is that I don't know which one's more popular, but what I think what we had in the early around the time that iTunes and Pandora were both going very strong is you'd have people. It was a symbiotic relationship. People would use Pandora to discover music, and then they would go buy it on iTunes. But digital downloads off iTunes or anywhere else are completely plummeting, and it's actually being right. replaced by streaming. So I, I think that a, a model like um, what Spotify and RDO are experimenting with, where, um, or especially actually with, with RDO, the way they have it is you can listen to the radio part for free, and then... If you really like a song and you want to listen to it on demand, then they'll say, "Would you like to pay ten dollars a month for for that experience?" So I, I I think that 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 could be a model model that works. There's there's definitely I think a symbiotic relationship between the the sort of algorithmic um, serendipitous discovery and then the you know on demand. I want to hear this right now. And I think the freemium idea, where there's a free service versus a paid service, we see we've seen that with a lot of other. Uh, sites, including LinkedIn, who you can have the free LinkedIn page or you can upgrade to their premium level. We see it with Hulu. We see it with a lot of other services, including Spotify, where I tend to use the free service. Does that mean as a software provider, they're making money on me still? Or is it to their best interest, obviously, to get me as a subscriber to subscribe? And I've been tempted. So what's the tipping point? I mean, what would you say is the tipping point for users to feel like they see enough value in the service. Like me, I'm just kind of stubborn. I just kind of hold out and say, you know what? I don't need to upgrade. I'm, you know, they're not going to sucker me in. What's, what's the, what's the tipping point for these uh, paid services? It's, I think it's the curation. It really is. It's not music. The access to music is free right now. I mean, YouTube is the biggest music service, the regular YouTube, not the one that they're going to launch is the largest music service in the world. But it's a really, I have to keep leaning forward. I have to keep picking what do I want to hear next? What do I want to hear next? And I think the reality is that we've learned most people like to lean back and be entertained. So if you have that balance between the radio product on RDO that, that we were discussing and the ability to then to lean forward and go deeper into an artist and get recommendation and get playlists not necessarily created by Sean Parker or LeBron James, but playlists that are generated either algorithmically from following you know, some of your activities plus recommendation, then most of the time I just want to listen. I don't want to work at it. And I think anyone that I've shown any of the services to, going back to Rhapsody in 2001, initially they want to play, they know what they want to hear. It's that tipping point when you get to the moment that you're not sure what you want to hear next, where there's that hot, you know, that aha moment, to use Heidi's phrase, of a song comes on that is exactly what you were looking for, but you didn't know you were looking for it. So it goes back to that same question um, that I asked before about, you know, and in the chat room, they're talking about renting music versus buying music and kind of this it's ownership. Not rent, it's not renting music. It's unfettered access. I mean, that renting music idea is so over the top. Are you renting cable TV? Are you renting radio? I mean, it's if you can hear all the music in the world for five, ten bucks a month, whenever you want to hear it on whatever device you're on, that's an incredible value. And to characterize it as, I don't want to rent my music, I want to own it, I'll give you a real quick example. A year ago, I, I've ripped... 10,000 CDs. I had a hundred and some thousand tracks. I went on vacation. I shut my Mac down. I came back. I fired my Mac up. I got the big black X. I went, no big deal. I've got a backup drive. I fired up my Western digital backup drive. I got a big black X. I lost over a hundred thousand songs. 10 years ago, I would have killed myself. I turned on Spotify and started thinking of anything I had ripped. Everything was there. So there was, I literally mourned for about 20 minutes and then basically started creating playlists on Spotify. 
But that's why things are different today. I mean, I lost all my music too at one point. I lost everything, all my CDs, movies, music, everything. But now so much of that is accessible and we don't really need to have a CD sitting around or a DVD or cassette tape or whatever it is uh, that, that you had in the day. You don't need to have that. But from the standpoint of where we get our content, is it the free model? Is it, let's look at YouTube. So we talked about YouTube earlier and I wonder if the YouTube model is broken. In fact, uh, Jeffrey, you and I were talking about uh, someone who's actually been a promoter of YouTube, who now YouTube is suing um, because she promoted them in helping artists get recognized. And YouTube hasn't really changed a lot. I mean, they do try to help people who, um, and not just in music, but certainly in a lot of other areas. So talk about that for a second. Yeah, I mean, the thing that's interesting about YouTube is it's, it is a, a discovery agent of new music whether people think it is or not. Uh, in this case, you had a person who was hawking um, uh, beauty products, uh, but she would use music and, and give credit to who the, who the artists were. Uh, and many people discovered who those artists were. Now, what they went and did after that, uh, we don't necessarily know. They went and downloaded those, uh, those, those artists uh, on iTunes or they listened to them through a streaming service, but... You know, publishers always get involved and say, hey, there's a copyright infringement here. And that's usually when uh, uh, things go awry. And, and in that case, uh, I think, you know, usually what will happen in, in, is, is YouTube will say, oh, well, you know, we thought you got clearance for all of this. That's something that you have to take care of. So uh, in this case, you know, record labels are uh, suing um, this individual for the fact that she used music that wasn't cleared. I, I think it's actually short-sighted on behalf of the labels to do that, but, you know, they're looking at it in terms of they want, uh, they want clearance. It's a copyright issue. Um, and yes, we're still talking about copyrights in, in 2014, uh, like we talked about copyrights in 1998 when Napster was around, like, well, we're, I think we'll always be talking about copyrights, but uh, in this case, uh, you know, people want, uh, want their fair share of, uh, of, of money up front, if they're if you're using music, uh, I think that model might have to change down the line too. Again, with you know you know, you know companies realizing that uh, there's ways to get their music used, especially in third party integration, that acts as a uh, discovery mechanism. And there's other ways then to monetize uh, through the sale of music or through third party licensing, etc. I think it absolutely has to change. Ted, what do you say? Well. I think artists deserve to be paid. I think songwriters deserve to be paid. There was a lot of resistance to um, doing deals with YouTube. Um, how, how candid can my language be on this show? <laughs> Keep it family friendly. Oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> so I was interviewing a guy named David Unn. David Unn at the time was head of uh, strategy and partnerships at Google and was trying to get the YouTube deal done. And... I end up doing a lot of interviews at a lot of con where I'm the interviewer at a lot of conferences. And I have this policy that I don't give questions out, out front. But I turned to David just before we were walking out on stage and I said, here's the opening question. Are you going to freak? And he said, I love it. Go for it. So we walk out on stage and I'm introducing him and I said, uh, it's David Unn from Google. And I said, David, let's ease into this. I don't want to be too controversial. Um, so I'm going to start with a softball question. Why are you trying to completely screw the music industry? And he says, wow, you know, I love that question. We're not trying to screw the music industry. We're trying to show them that there are more revenue streams than they realize. And that the idea of selling people a CD is not the final revenue stream for music. And it was a great conversation. Uh, and he ended up getting most of his deals done in the next month. It gave him the opportunity to basically say, you're so focused on selling a silver disc that you're not looking at all the other revenue streams. But when services say to the labels or say to the artists or say to the songwriters or to the publishers, uh, well, you should use our platform for promotion and not worry about making money from us. In some cases, the money that could be made from that platform is the only place they're really going to see a significant revenue. So that's a problem. And there's a balance there. And the point I'm trying to make in my normal long-winded way is neither side is completely right on this. 
there are new models and there are new ways to make money. But at the same time, you can't basically say, you know, we're your best friend and don't worry about getting money from us, get money from somebody else. And it's hard when you're seeing the valuations on these companies to, you know, sit back and go, well, wait a minute, uh, Spotify is now worth, you know, $10 billion, which is now more than the value of the music industry. There's something wrong here because Spotify is totally based on the copyrights of the publishers, the labels, the artists, and the writers. So we got to get to a middle ground here, and we're still not there. So is the middleman the barrier to entry? Have we broken that down? I mean, what what would, okay, what would your advice be, Ted, to artists today who have really great music to share and they need to figure out where to go next? Initially, um, I can't remember, uh, Duncan Sheik. There was an artist, uh, there is an artist by the name of Duncan Sheik. And I did a panel about the topic we're talking about now back in 2000 in Las Vegas. And I said, how do you feel about people sharing your music and how do you feel about giving your music away? And he said, I have to believe if I'm giving away a couple songs from my new album or I'm letting people share my new single, I can't panic and believe that's the best music I'm ever gonna create. Uh, he says, I just like to have some kind of a say in this. So. I always say I encourage artists if they're, you know, if they're talented to share their music with as many people as possible in the beginning. But you should have the right to monetize. And that's where I'm the most conflicted guy you're ever going to meet. I can go on for 20 <laughs> minutes on this, so I'm going to stop. But basically, there's a balance between, you know, this music is free and everybody gets whatever they want and... How do we create the new paradigms going forward? Because we're in this awkward period where everybody's trying to figure out, okay, how do I make a living? David, what does the industry need to do to stay relevant uh, based on your opinion? Well, well, one point about monetizing, especially off of the streaming music services that I think is important to make is that um, I, I do not know if, if music or content in general can be as reliant on advertising dollars as it is. <laughs> you look, I and I I know that every everything is. You, you need to have multiple multiple revenue streams, etc. Um, but when you look at the RIA statistics from the first half of this year, um, the amount of money that Spotify is able to pay for people who actually subscribe to the service who are willing to pay $10 a month for all the music they, they would ever want, which is an amazing, amazing bargain. They are able to pay far higher payouts for those streams than they are for the streams of the free users um, who are, who, that, that money is basically only supported by ads. So obviously advertisers, you know, there's a tons of money, there's a ton of money there and that's going to play a role, but I, I don't know if this will ever happen, but I just really like to get to a point where people just realize, you know, it's not that painful to pay $10 a month for literally every song in the world. And I think I think if we get to that point and advertising is still uh, plays a role, I, I think that the, the music industry as a whole will have, there'll be much more money to go around. Okay, David, you've made a compelling argument. <laughs> for the subscription model. And Jeff, uh, it's what is really it? really great. You know, I, I don't mean to reject, but I mean, David, it's, we sit in Starbucks having meetings at $5 a cup of coffee arguing whether music, all the music you ever want to hear is worth 10 bucks a month. It's insane. I agree. I'm the, I'm so, you know what, convincing me has is, is been difficult, but you are doing a good job. Jeff, what would you say the, the industry needs to do different as far as a business model? Well, one of the big areas of the music industry I've always paid attention to because I was a DJ for many years is what EDM is doing or the electronic electronic dance music. And it's, it's everyone thinks it's blown up overnight, but it's really sort of 20, 20 plus years in the making. And the business model there really is many of the uh, producers of, of the music um, produce music because they make the majority of their money in live appearances. They get paid a lot of money uh, in live appearances. And even those on the lower end of the spectrum still get paid quite handsomely uh, to go and, and, and gig in various uh, clubs. And you have to remember there's 
not a band uh, sort of model there. So they're, they're able to keep the money to them uh, uh, for themselves, one or two people at the most. But the interesting thing there is many, I think, of those artists have, have you know, music is still important to them in terms of monetizing that angle. And I, you know, agree with David and Ted on that. Um, but I think they've put more emphasis on, and it's a lot like we sp spoke about in terms of publishing, a writer might write a book and might not necessarily get paid handsomely to write that book. They might get a few dollars here and there. I mean, especially uh, low end writers, but if they're able to go out and talk and get paid for those speaking engagements, they make a lot of, they could make a lot of money over time. And I think that's where the music model has to think again. And, and it's something that's very difficult if you're on the publishing or you're on the distribution or you're on the marketing side is you might not necessarily have a background in merchandising or, live events, et cetera. But that's really where the new monetization is going to happen. Uh, and it's going to happen whether, you know, the big parts, the big behemoths of the industry have any say or not. Because, uh, again, I, I believe in the in the model of, you know, you get in a van, you go, you go out, you play shows, um, and, and you, you can make a living that way. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a glorious or a glamorous, uh, uh, life, but, uh, uh, I do want it. I do want the world where at least people can can create art and and survive off of it. I think that I think that's important. I mean, we don't want to we don't want to bastardize art to the point where it's uh, just seen as something that's you know free for other people to it to enjoy. This is definitely going to have to be part one of a much bigger conversation. There's no way we can cram all this into an hour. It's unbelievable how much there is to talk about this. And you guys have all been really great sports about hanging in there. And Ted, I wanted to ask you so many questions. We have to have, have you back. But I have to sneak one in. So uh, Van Halen, you were promoting yes. Van Halen. What's what's a really interesting like story about Van Halen that you have? I know, I want to hear it. <laughs> I can see uh, Jeff going, mm-hmm. There was, I'm, I'm trying to think PG. You were saying keep it family oh, friendly. Oh, well, as <laughs> family strong. friendly as possible. Uh, I, um, oh, boy. I mean, they were, they were <laughs> There's amazing. There's so many that aren't with. rolling. No, no. They were, they were amazing to work with. Watching them work a room, watching them work radio, watching them work a crowd. Uh, they would, you know, they would do things. I, I think I can tell you the PG version. You can go to my Facebook page and see the photos, um, I think they're public. We went into a radio station in Seattle in 82, I think it was KISW, and uh, two girls that were friends of the band came along and we had just met them, picked them up at school. They went to uh, parochial school and we brought them to the station and the band's doing the interview at four o'clock in the afternoon. And all of a sudden the two girls from the parochial school start stripping. It turns out they weren't two girls from a parochial school. They were two strippers from a strip club in Seattle. And the look in the photos, the look on the DJ's face when he realized what was going on, uh, it wasn't definitely, it was, it changed the term afternoon drive. It was a whole uh, other experience. <laughs> yeah, I've been to your Facebook page, Ted. Those are not PG rated photos. So I'm just saying, okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. You're going to have suddenly a lot of fans on Facebook checking out your pictures. Um, I, I can't, so, so can you say here, um, is it which which version of Van Halen do we like? Is it Hager? Is it David Lee Roth? It was David Lee Roth. I mean, I like Sammy. I worked with Sammy. I worked with Dave. Sammy Sammy's a great guy. Dave, the way that all worked together was phenomenal. And uh, I got into a Twitter fight with Valerie Bertinelli. Um, and then I had the Valerie Bertinelli Twitter followers basically assailing me. <laughs> Because I really believe she broke the band up, and she was she was the Yoko Ono of Van Halen, absolutely. Really? Oh, absolutely. And uh, so when this came out in an article a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, the Valerie Twitter army came after me. It was a lot of I'd never been attacked on Twitter before. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's so perfect for you to say that. Um, I I have to confess, you know, David, you're too young, and Jeff, you probably too. But I, Van Halen. Uh, David Lee Roth was one of my, um, it was my third album that I owned. So just saying. it was a great time. I had six years with, I went out with them for six years and watching them grow and watching them, you know, just, they literally were in March of 1978, they played the whiskey 
And in September of 1978, they opened for the Rolling Stones at the Orange Bowl. They went from a 300-seat room to 100,000 people and never choked at all, never looked back. They just grew to the size of the audience. It was fantastic. I know we're out of time, uh, really, but I just have to ask because I think, you know— what makes a band successful? Because I, there's a lot of great artists that have great music that don't get discovered. And then there's really good like bar bands, which I've heard you call Van Halen, I think a bar band at certainly at one point. Right. Um, and they have it's such a great stage. They did certainly have such a great stage presence. Um, David Lee Roth might be a little crazy, but he really was an, you know, an artist from the standpoint of performing. What made them a success? I think it's this... It's a delicate balance, and I've seen this. I mean, I got to work with you, too. I worked with Dire Straits. I worked with Fleetwood Mac for 10 years. I used to refer to that I did... I Am I am I still with you? Yeah. Oh, okay, I heard a ping. I, um, I referred to my job at Warner was to do station wagon tours. I would take bands out on their first tour and then continue to work with them. So my station wagon tours were Fleetwood Mac, Prince, Van Halen, uh, Pretenders, Talking Heads... In the case of all those bands, they take themselves seriously, but they don't take themselves too seriously. They maintain a certain sense of humor about not being, you know, uh, they're, they're not morose about we're the greatest thing that's ever come down the pike. I mean, Van Halen took what they did really seriously in terms of doing great shows, but they were able to laugh at themselves, to, you know, to have a sense of humor about it. I had a, an artist, I won't say who he is, maybe on a further show, who I told him he was being a little bit juvenile, and he turned to me and said, is that the way you speak to? And he referred to himself in the third person. And I, really? Went, Real? I went, really? I think we're done. And we were done. Um, I don't have the time or the patience, I mean, historically. I like to work with people that are incredibly talented, but realize that they have to serve their audience and they and that they have to they have to relate. And so Van Halen to answer it, Van Halen was probably the most fun I ever had most of the time with my clothes on. And whoa. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that last little bit of comment there. You know, it, but it's just a good full circle around to what our first guest said, which when um I mentioned her TED talk and she talks about what it's like to be a good leader. And I think just being an artist, when you look at the really successful, whether they're actors or musicians, they have a bit of humility about them. And they exactly. really, they, they know how to connect with their fans and their audience. And those are the people that I respect and that I want to give my money to. That's going to get me to sign up for that premium service for sure. Um, you guys have all been great. I'm super impressed with all of you and I appreciate your time. And if somebody wants to follow you, you go first, Jeff. What's the best way they can do that? Sure, you can follow me on Twitter at DJ G E O F F E at DJ Jeffy. Uh, once a DJ, always a DJ. Uh, or you can read uh, my thought leadership on my blog, futuristlab.tumblr.com. And good luck with all the changes at Microsoft this week. I'm excited to, to see the evolution of the company. Thanks. David, if somebody wants to follow your work and uh, your personal music and the things that you've done, what's the best way they can do that? Um, just follow Holmes DM on Twitter um, and go to pando.com. Usually write uh, two things a day there. Um, and then for the for the music, uh, you know, just yeah, just follow me on Twitter. I, I tweet stuff out from time to time. Yes, he does. And Ted, the, one of the icons in music that uh, I was so happy to have you come on and tell your story. And we'll definitely have to come you have you come back and talk more. If somebody wants to follow you, connect with your agency or whatever, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, my Twitter handle is Spinal Tap, and uh, it's, so it's at Spinal Tap or uh, at Tag Strategic. And uh, while I've been sitting here, three friend, friend requests have come in on Facebook. For, <laughs> so thank, thanks for that, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I do what I can. Oh. And I, the next time we have you back on, we're going to have you talk about why Spinal Tap. So everybody's going to have to tune back into the next show. Thanks, guys, and I appreciate you being a part of the show today. Thank you. It's been Thanks great. so much. Thanks all. Take care. Well, that wraps up another episode of Marketing Mavericks. You can follow me. Go to my Facebook page. It's pretty G-rated uh, at, at uh, Tanya Hall on Facebook, or you can try Barzini. That's B-A-R-Z-H-I-N-I. -I. 
or connect with me on Twitter at, at Tanya Hall Radio. Use the hashtag Marketing Mavericks. I want to hear what you think about the show. What guests would you like to hear from? What subjects would you like for us to talk about? And what questions would you like for us to answer? And if you're old school, definitely email me. You can go to Marketing Mavericks, or excuse me, actually, that's Mavericks at twit.tv. That's Mavericks at twit.tv. And we hope to hear from you very soon. Thanks, everybody. Until next week, talk to you then. There's a guy named Marty Bandier who runs Sony ATV Publishing. And he called me up one day and he says, I need you to come speak at our publishing convention. And I said, okay. And he flew me in. He goes, do you think you can do two hours? <laughs> and so at roughly about three hours and 15 minutes, he goes, can you start wrapping it up now? Because I went, <laughs> I, I, I said, I can keep, you want more? I can keep going. But, but I, I've been trying to work on a book for like three years and I just can't focus on it. Because every time I tell these stories, people go, have you thought of doing a book? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, I am super impressed. You got a lot of stories to tell and I try to give a teaser for our next show. So we'll have you come back. Music but I'd like to, I'm, what I'd love to do is come back and talk more about the debate. When I said I'm really conflicted on all this, there are so many sides to the issue. I mean, and again, we're off the air now, right? Well, no, everybody can still hear us. Um, we, the show has ended, but we're still live. So all of the fans that are paying attention to our live stream are still listening. So, oh, okay. Um, you know, I mean, I don't. I mean, I, I, I love. I was on Pandora's advisory board when Tim. I've known Tim since he started what was Savage Beast, and then he called me up one day, and I have this thing where I can remember where I was when a lot of things happened. So I'm in LAX at gate 42 at American Airlines and the phone rings and it's Tim saying, I'm gonna change Savage Beast to this thing called Pandora. I'm gonna connect a radio service to the uh, genome project. And so I joined the advisory board and I think Pandora is great, but I think there's a lot of discussion that goes on right now about, you know, is Pandora paying artists enough? And I don't think they are. I think for, if, if, Tim can make five, ten million dollars a year. There may be a few more bucks to throw to the artists, and we got to figure out where that is. I mean, you know, there's all sides. Again, I'd like to talk more about, you know, where the tension is between all the different people that are sitting at the table right now. But I think that's where, you know, that's where this this evolution is taking us to. How do artists get paid? What do the software providers that are providing us with this great content? What do they do? I think. We're still in a discovery phase. We still don't know what we want to be when we grow up, right? Right, but even like, uh, I'll tell you, and I'll be public about this. There's a client that, I, that I've worked with. Uh, there's a service called Lyric Find. And Lyric Find was the first legal lyric service, and it's run by a guy named Daryl Ballantyne and his partner, Mohammed Mudadine. Daryl walked up to me in Toronto in 2003 and said, can I be your intern at EMI? I'll come down to LA and work for you. He interned for me for six months and I said, what are you going to do when you're done? He says, I'm going to go off and start the world's first legal lyric service. Would you like to be on the board? And I said, yeah, sure, kid, whatever. Yeah, it sounds great. Call me. About six months later, I get a package in the mail. It's board papers. I'm joining the board. So I've worked with him now for 10 years and watched him grow this into a multi-million dollar business with no investment from anybody other than like 20 grand from his parents. And it's been really successful. I won't go into the exact economics, but up until this past year, it was a pretty symbiotic relationship with the publishers to get the lyrics rights. We're at a meeting with a major publisher and I'm sitting at the conference table and I could do the visual, but I'm sitting sort of on their side of the table. And the publisher suggests new terms that were, owner. I mean, beyond onerous. I mean, they were just whatever. I moved my chair to the end of the table so I wasn't on either side of the table and I said, this is the moment where Daryl and Mo fire me from the board and you ask me to leave the room. Are you? Ah, oh, <laughs> that is the worst.